Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Construction PM Principles and Tips. Today we're going to be discussing pull plans. In particular, I'm going to be looking at phase pull plans, which is part of the last planner system. There's a lot of misconceptions about what a pull plan is, but you're seeing it a lot more uh, being implemented by mid to large size construction companies and smaller companies as well, as the word gets out that this is a very effective way of planning, scheduling, and managing your construction projects. So in this session, as I said, we'll just focus in on this area of phase pull plans. I'm a professor of construction management. If this is new to you, this station or channel, uh, please take a look. Look at the playlist, uh, click subscribe. This channel is all about the construction industry, uh, principles and practices. So there's a lot of different playlists. You'll find everything from learning how to use Microsoft Project to construction business management, site management, project management, tools and mental models that you can use to improve yourself in the construction industry. All right, so let's get started. So the last planner system is part of lean construction. And, you know, I think people get hung up with the word lean construction a little bit. Let's just say a more effective way to manage your construction projects, given that there's a lot of waste and a lot of times clients aren't getting the value they're seeking and contractors aren't getting the profits they're seeking either. And trade partners are also having issues. So let's see how we can think about making improvements in the construction industry. And last planner system is a really good um, starting point. It's a tool, a process, a system within lean construction. It's not lean construction per se. It's part of it. All right. And so we have our master schedule. And this is just going to be a quick overview because we're going to look more at the phase pull plan. But you have your master schedule. Uh, you have your phase schedule, which is where we often call this a pull plan. And I'm using the terms that they've used, but technically a phase plan or a milestone schedule, typically when we get into one milestone at a time, we call it a pull plan. And the difference between plan and schedule is a schedule has dates, whereas a plan really has sequences and durations. So it's a, you haven't put committed to exact dates yet. And that's true with all uh, project management terminology. We separate uh, schedules by having dates. Then there's what we call a make ready um, plan, which is basically now our six week look ahead schedule, much more detailed. Weekly, what's coming up each week and daily huddles are daily learning and feedback mechanisms so that we can quickly iterate, adjust, pivot as we need to. Um, so I, you know, this usually throws everybody like there's so many levels, this is just too much. It's actually not too much. It's actually a very good process that gets you in the zone and understands very clearly that the further you are away from doing work, the less likely your accuracy on exact durations and, and exactly how something's going to happen are. As you get closer to the work, that tightens up, that tightens up. And the further you are away from the work and the less that you've communicated to others, also the less likely it is to be accurate. So we try to build a system that makes it easy for communication to take place and the tapping of that knowledge. And really, if we want to think about it, we want to build confidence, as Albert Bandura would say. We want to have self-efficacy, confidence in what we do, right? And that's important. And so what we want to do is build that confidence. We want to build that network and get strong commitments from the people that are involved doing the work. If you don't get commitments from people, then it's not likely that it's gonna happen. And if they've been involved in the process, it's much easier for them to commit to it. Uh, and as we get really close, we're trying to work out any potential constraints or issues that can roadblock us, that can bottleneck us, that can prevent us from 
moving forward as we planned. And so the weekly work planning is really sort of getting into that detail. And then, as I said, the daily huddles, what have we learned and how can we improve upon this? So we're really going from we should be able to do this, right? At this stage, you know, this is this, what we're doing this master schedule for is to actually identify that we can get this overall project done in this start date and this finish date. So we do have to pull on historical data and a whole bunch of other things that we'll talk about. But we want to understand that we can get this done without being so granular and detailed that it kind of is nonsensical, like there's just too much detail in it. Uh, we want to be able to identify effectively a series of milestones that then we can work more closely with as the work comes more close, right? And that's where we move into where we should be able to do this. We want to basically understand that we can do this. And from there, we're going to go to our make ready. And we're pulling from this, basically, the first part of this is going to tell us what we need to do in the make ready. And so we're going from should to can to will weekly. Well, that's again the first week of the six week and we're more sure as it comes up because it's next week. We're more confident we can do something that we've set up for next week and we've adjusted as we get closer. And if we've seen something that can't be done, we've rearranged it so we're pretty confident that we can get that done next week. That's why will and then did. Right. So now we're just confirming that we're able to do that. And if we weren't, we're really trying to pivot on that and learn from that. So that's kind of, you know, the quick three minute version of Last Planner. But as I said, I want to get into the master and the, the actual uh, pull plan aspect of where this comes from. So it's the long term approach. Um, it should include all the major phases of the work. There shouldn't be gaps of things that are missed because then that means that our schedule is probably not going to be realistic if you've got a whole section of work um, missing. It should encompass the work that we need to do without being so granular that you have 10,000 activities for it. Uh, so that's, that's important. But we really want to also identify milestones as you'll see in the next um, slide. Uh, so it really needs to um, be encompassing not so detailed like a make ready plan will be. And it needs to be updated because this is what tells you how you're doing overall. So you can, and this is, again, you know, purists and lean may not be too happy with the aspect of just, you know, sort of saying, well, we're looking at the master schedule and we're updating because we should really be focusing on this part. But realistically, in most cases, you're going to have to provide an updated schedule to the client. And I look at it that if this has been done pretty well, when you update this, it'll give you the long term perspective through the critical path as to how the project is going. It's also documenting certain things at certain points, which in our adversarial relationships that we typically are in in construction, uh, we have to have some sort of form of documenting that. And as I said, it gives you sort of the long term view of how the project is doing. So that should be updated. Um, it will never be as accurate as the short term planning schedules because it's so far out into the future, right? From that perspective, the last planner system is really going to get it down into the next levels where you have um, the opportunities to detail things out. Now, that doesn't mean you can't pull plan a master project schedule. You could if you have procurement of the major pro major contractors done early enough. And that might be a reflection of the type of contract model that you've worked with. So if it's an integrated project delivery, that's a lot easier step to take because you've really sort of integrated the, your production of the project into your design and you can really collaboratively schedule and pull plan a master project schedule to identify all of the specific milestones that you want to get around, right? That you need to identify. And of course, these little diamonds here are milestones and they can be pulled out and then they can be looked at and identified in a particular way. So a master schedule uh, can be pull planned effectively. Now, pull planning means that you're going to schedule it from the end to the beginning, not from the beginning 
to the end, which is kind of counterintuitive to the way that I was taught to um, schedule projects. But we'll talk a little bit about the logic behind that. Uh, one of the nice things about pull planning is you're really thinking about an activity and then, okay, I'm at the end. What do I need next step before the end? In other words, what is the thing that has to be completed before I can complete the project? And then you just keep working backwards from that aspect to really establish the sequencing and durations of the work. It doesn't prevent you from then looking at it from the beginning and looking at it forward. So for you know those of you that are sort of set in your ways that way, it doesn't prevent that at all. You can definitely do that um, and that can be helpful. Now a phase pull plan is going to take um, a particular period like maybe from foundation inspection approved to close in start. So maybe from this milestone to this milestone, we are going to do a phase pull plan, all right? And usually a phase pull plan is going to be something that's in the neighborhood of three to six months of work. So three to six months, it's still fairly long out there, but it's not out there like, you know, a year or two years or three years, depending on what the size of the project is. Um, so in this particular case, where are we at? We're at July, we're at um, July 22nd and we're going to October 29th. So July 22nd to October 29th. So I don't know, that's about three months or so. All right, slightly more than three months. That's reasonable. Uh, it's a, not a huge project, this one, so that makes a lot of sense. And so basically with that, we're going to look at creating that and working from that period to the other period, which is milestone to milestone. We have other milestones in between, right? So if I go back here, there's, you know, slab on grade, framing complete, inspections approved, right? Uh, there's a series of milestones. It doesn't have to be only from one milestone to the other. It could be what we'd call micro milestones or or site super milestones that may be integrated, or these are more major milestones that we want to schedule over that time period. And so what we do is we invite the contractors that are going to be doing the work during that period of time and we have a pull plan session. So what we're going to do is we're going to work from this milestone and we're going to work backwards, right? So we're probably coming up on the work in here and we're doing this out ahead of time and we want to have this pull plan so that we've got everybody on board for the sequencing of the detailed activities that are going to take place in this area. So each trade is going to come to this meeting and we'll talk a little bit at the end about, you know, you should have a pre-meeting with each trade to make sure they're really grasping their activities and what they need to in order to do the work, right? Um, and so you're really collaborating with them. They're putting out their activities on post-it notes and each trade has their own color post-it note. That represents their work. And ideally they come to the meeting that they've already sort of laid out their activities for what they need to do during this time period. So they've given it some thought, right? And then they have preconceived ideas, but then a different trade might have a different idea. And so what we want to do is get these, these durations and these activities on the board and we want to have discussions around them because there may be conflicts or there may be some constraints. Constraint being something that may prevent us from being able to do that work. If we can identify that early enough, then we can work to remove that constraint so that we can actually do the work. Um, so it's very, very helpful. And that's being very proactive instead of reactive in the schedule. Um, so the schedules develop backwards going from the finished milestone back this way. All right, and discussions are taking place during that process of order, right? So by working backwards, um, each trade is determining what do I need in order for me to start? You know, like if it's the roofing trade, I need to have the decking on the roof or I cannot do my work, 
right? Um, if it's the structural steel trade, maybe it's I need to have the foundation walls in with all of the anchor bolts in the correct places before I can start. What is it that each trade needs before they can start? And we call that conditions of satisfaction. What do you need? And to what level of quality do you need it at so you can effectively do the work? So you can see there's a lot of opportunity for cross communication to take place trade to trade, which in traditional methods doesn't happen that often. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna qualify that. There are, you know, again, I I really want to get these processes out there without offending anybody. Um, you know, and there's different approaches. You know, you can say, oh, you've been doing it wrong for this many, many years. And, da, 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 da. and that just gets people's back up and they get, you know, resistant to, to changing. On the other hand, there are a lot of site supers and project managers that have worked for many years. If you ask them what is lean, they don't even know. But yet they've come across a series of practices and principles that they developed that in a lot of ways closely proximate a lot of lean practices. And those are the ones that typically are pretty successful and they, they sort of think, well, I'm just using traditional methods, but there's a lot of things that aren't so traditional that they are actually using and they just don't know it. Um, so I think there are a number of those practitioners out there that are successful, but I do also think that there's a lot that we've got room to improve. You know, I had to change my ways of doing things over the last 10, 15 years as well, because I could see that there's these other opportunities and methodologies that make things go better. Is it easy? No. Does it take time? Yes. Uh, but nothing worthwhile ever was easy and fast, right? So um, I think from that perspective, the investment is well worth it. Um, so... Working backwards does not prevent you from also reviewing the schedule going forward. If we start from the end and we get all the post-it notes in place and we've had our discussions as we've been doing it, we can then start, okay, let's start from the beginning now and let's look at it again. And you'll probably find that you have to organize and adjust and discussions go on till you get commitments on the various time frames and now you're you're hitting it, right? So now you're becoming um, much more satisfied and the contractors that are involved in the process, the contractors that are involved in the process know what was working, like know really what each trade is doing and they've had discussions and they pointed out possible constraints. They're, they're much more committed to the process at that point because it's, it's, that's what the system does. It kind of engages and involves people uh, which is more di much more difficult in traditional methods where a site super is going individually and just finding information, getting feedback and going back individually. That is a, that's not a fun process and it's a lot more autocratic, a lot more difficult to get buy-in. So the advantages of uh, having a pull plan are many. The other thing is when we start from the beginning and just go forward, that's what we call push. When we think about it, we're just trying to get dates. We're just trying to get the sequence and the duration. And what tends to happen is stuff just gets pushed onto the project, whether it's ready for it or not. When if we start thinking from the end to the beginning, it's like, I need, the, I need this complete and then I can do the work. I need this complete and then I can give the, get, do the work. And when I do the work, I'm giving this to the next party. They're getting that. It's not thinking in terms of push, it's thinking about making the work ready as it's needed. And that's a different sort of psychology um, that takes place. Uh, Charlie Munger, uh, Warren Buffett's uh, partner who recently passed, um, said, invert, always invert. Turn a situation or problem upside down. Look at it backwards. And he got it from the ma mathematician Jacobi, German mathematician. And really, invert, always invert, is looking at things backwards, looking at things from the end and working your way um, to the beginning. Uh, Stephen Covey said, um, you know, thinking about things, start with the end in mind. Where do we want to be? Let's start there and work our way backwards. So there is a lot of advantages to doing that, even though it may be a little bit of rewiring of the brain as you 
as you go into the process, it can be really, really um, helpful uh, in making sure that things, you know, what do I need? Clarifying that. What do I need, right? Instead of I'm going to start now and then I'm going to do this, right? You're thinking, well, what, what does the person before me have to have ready so that I can start? Right. And that's really clarifying those points. So that's really the major advantages of doing a pull plan and zoning in on a particular time period, usually, like I said, three months to six months, and then detailing that out from this to the back. And a pull plan, you really don't need to have dates in this process. You really want people to think about durations. You want them to think about crew sizes and you want them to think about sequencing and the logic of the work um, that they need to do. So that's a big part of what they need to do during that uh, process. Now, prior to this, prior to this, they got to come ready. So a trade partner needs to come ready. And you notice I'm using the word trade partner instead of subcontract. I want us to think more collaboratively. We're partners in getting this project done and we're no one knows everything and we want to pull that information from the particular trade partners that we're working with. So we have a pre-phase pull plan meeting individually without, with each trade partner. And I was just recently doing uh, some uh, lean training with uh, Colin, uh, sorry, Colin uh, Milberg. And uh, he went through this sort of process of a individual pull plan meeting with each trade and he did it really 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 well and so full full credit to uh, Colin on this uh, in the AGC um, lean certification program uh, and so basically in this we look at basically the purpose to ensure that you know we want to make sure that the trade has thought things through before they come to this meeting so because sometimes they show up and it's like okay uh, yeah I haven't had a chance to look at the plans uh, what's up right? No, this is where we want to get them discussing, thinking, and making sure that we're not going to be in reactive mode in the meeting because they'll kind of slow us down and make it more difficult. So we're trying to get that meeting out. Um, we're trying to figure out, you know, what's their thoughts on sequencing of the work? What's their thoughts on batch sizes for the work? What's their thoughts on crew sizes and durations, right? So we're trying to look for individual sort of feedback on that. And it's not to say that we're agreeing with everything. We may be challenging some things in those thoughts, but we're trying to ask them more open questions that they're not just saying yes or no to. We want them to really open this up and start pulling it out, you know, so that they really have a good understanding of what they're looking at. So what crew size, and that's important because that's going to sort of govern, that's definitely going to be governing what they're able to do, right? And at what kind of velocity they're able to do it at. And what are their gives and gets? And I'm thinking about um, Fernando Flores and basically uh, reliable promises. And I'm thinking about conditions of satisfaction. What do they need? So reliable promises is another video I did, but basically how do you get commitments and really understanding? So what do they need? And then basically what are they going to be giving to the other party, having clarity on that so that they're coming into this meeting, the main phase pull plan meeting prepared, right? And what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What kind of opportunities or threats? That'd be your constraints, trying to get them thinking about possible things that could throw a hiccup into this process? What are the things that are keeping them up at night that are bothering them about this project? These are things that you want to pull during this um, pre-phase pull plan meeting, getting them really sort of on this. And do we have clarity or do we need a follow-up? I put 2080 there. That's another lean tool, uh, basically. Uh, the Pareto principle. Look, you're going to have some trade partners that you're going to have meetings with this and it's going to be actually a pretty fun process. They've been through it before. They, they're experienced at it. Uh, they're eager. Uh, and then you're going to have some that it's going to be like pulling teeth. 
And you know what? Whether you're doing this or you're running a regular project, those same ones are going to be whether it's pulling teeth. So that doesn't change. But you really want to identify the ones that it's like pulling teeth because you're going to have to spend more time with them. That's the 2080, right? Uh, and so 20% of your trades is going to take 80% of your time, so to speak. It might be just that they're new and they just need a little bit more um, explanation, a little bit more um, hand holding in the beginning, but they're eager. That's different than they're resistant, right? Uh, so, but you under, you'll understand and you'll identify that and you'll get a good idea going into the actual pull plan meeting who they may be so that that makes it a little bit easier ahead of time. You can be more proactive on that, right? And making sure that they take the time, you know, you can probably get a lot of it done in the pre-phase pull plan meeting, but that they take the time to have their activities pre-marked out on post-it notes. So you want them to have their activities pre-marked out on post-it notes and those post-it notes will have essentially what the gives are, what the gets are, what the crew size is, and what the duration is. So each post-it note, what is the activity? What am I going to give? What do I need to have done? Sometimes for the gets, you might need one, you might need two or three that have to be done before you can start, right? What crew size am I planning and duration? Understanding crew size is important too in the pull planning se session because that'll give you an idea of geographic space and what you need to do in that. And the pull planning session, it can be done in, depending what you're doing, into swim lanes. Swim lanes basically means, you know, you got first floor, you got second floor, you got third floor. These are swim lanes so you can show the flow from one floor to the next from the different trades that are doing the work. So there's a lot of things that can be discussed and set up through this pull plan um, meeting. And really, as as... Uh, Colin was mentioning, don't don't ask yes or no questions. Really, really try to get them to um, critically think about what they need to do. Right? Are you going to be ready? Yes. Um, do you have enough people? Yes. Um, do you have your figure your durations figured out? Yes. Um, do you have any problems on the project? No. That doesn't tell you anything. Right? So you got to really get them to give details and so it's how you learn to ask questions more effectively uh, that um, is important and you don't want to get into a situation where you're telling them you want basically them to think about it and to give you their thoughts on how they would like to uh, run their aspect of the project and then you can challenge those things with further questions right it's not that you're just saying oh okay that's fine oh that's okay uh, you got to be going deeper and deeper and deeper to really understand and get them thinking. If they've thought everything out well and you're able to then coordinate that effectively and make the adjustments necessary during the actual pull plan session, you're well along the way for then the next phase of work, which is developing your make ready schedules, which I'll do in another video. So I hope that's given you a, a, the first part, an understanding of the pull planning process and how we work from a finished milestone back with the activities, putting them pre-done. We have this pre-phase pull plan meeting so that the actual trades come to the project prepared. So I'm, I hope uh, this has given you some insight. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please uh, leave a comment and help build the community by subscribing. Uh, to the channel. Uh, I'm Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.